Good afternoon. Thank you for joining the Pasco School Board of Directors this afternoon for a study session on the P Pasco School District Facility Master Plan update. The school board, along with the district, um, in the past year has has talked about and has taken action on looking at our facilities planning with a refreshed approach. Um, we've hired MGT Consulting Group, and they've done work for us. We, as a school board, in the past couple years have defined our customers as all of the children and their families in the Pasco School District. And we've defined the owners of the Pasco School District as all community members and, and those who provide funding to the school district. And we've, we've decided to take this refreshed approach to increase the way that they take part in our decision making process um, through this long term facilities master plan update. This master plan will help guide the school board uh, in decision making uh, important decisions in the future uh, in the long term. But in the short term, we're also looking at it. Uh, we failed a, a bond in February. Uh, we've been looking around. Everybody's seen the growth out there. And we have been trying to decide whether we run a bond in November or at a later date past then. This is one small part of uh, that decision making process for the board. Um, and we're happy to have Joe here to, to lead us through some numbers and help spur some more discussion. And he's going to help us even in the end tie all of this together, everything he's been doing with the community so that the school board has more information to make well-informed decisions. Um, to that end, uh, we're fast approaching those uh, decision timelines. And so it was very important that we have the opportunity to get in front of you tonight and give you an update on some important aspects of um, this process and those decisions around those uh, situations that we're going to need to make in the next few months. Um, I, I just want to start by saying we're going we're to look at a couple of critical things tonight. Um, one, we've got some a, a, a kind of a rough but some information on our community engagement process from last week that I've provided for you. I've provided for you uh, uh, some research documentation on grade configuration that I want to walk you through uh, tonight as well. Um, it's pretty in-depth, so uh, some of that might be for you to digest uh, later. Um, and also, I want to give you a sense of timeline and how, over the next month, we're really going to come to conclusion on components of the process, as you alluded to, Scott. So first off, let's just talk about some project goals. And um, it, it, I'm sorry, but can I move? Or do, if I move, I, they don't pick me up. Is that correct? OK, all right. Then I'll just I'll try to stand still. Um, the engagement process last week, I, I felt, went really well. Um, we had one on May 3rd at the PAC. As you know, that's at Pasco High School Parent Advisory Council. And then the three um, at Ochoa, Stevens, and McLaughlin on the 16th, 17th, and 18th. We'll look at that data in, in a moment and kind of give you a sense of some takeaways from that, those four nights. Um, we've established the standards based on educational programs. That's been completed. We've talked about that. We've incorporated that into the assessment data. You've seen the assessment data. You've got another copy of it tonight. Uh, we're going to look at it in terms of capacity uh, in a couple of different grade, grade, grade configuration scenarios uh, so that we can better understand how that impacts capacity. But those standards are established. They've been integrated into our process, and they came from the hard work of, of the team. Um, tonight we begin a, a three-meeting series on really looking at what the facility needs are long and short term. Um, so we'll have a meeting together this evening. We'll have a meeting with the Community Builders Group on the 6th. That will be a very um, important meeting um, and probably is going to go a bit longer than we've anticipated. We, I think we have that for 5.30 to 7. We'll probably need to stretch that out, but we can talk about that in a minute. And then uh, again on June 27th, we'll be together to talk about uh, if we decide to run a November in bond, um, what are the final recommendations so that you have the opportunity to get all of the information necessary to formulate a resolution by July so that it can be ready to go August 1st. We want to use the data from the community input session to really guide this and, and I think um, 
structure this in a way that represents what the community has been telling us and not just the community builders group but the community at large. Um, we will, in addition, complete an organizational effectiveness study to support the master planning effort um, in August of 2017. We'll complete a space inventory study, basically, remember, with the numbers of portables, the numbers of schools, examining how each portable is used in relationship to the school and how that influences capacity. And then we will also want to look at finalizing this plan um, and putting it together by October of 2017. Is that, sorry, is that a space inventory study? Is that due for September 17? That's it's on correct. a separate bullet, but okay. Yeah, I, th I think we hit a return there. I apologize for the typo, but yes. that is, is that part of the efficiency study that we've talked about? Like the efficiency study, organizational effectiveness study, is uh, in August, and the space inventory study is in the 2017 those will both be chapters in the master plan okay okay so the efficiency study looks at the organization and its effectiveness and efficiency and work we may be able to change um, different uh, kinds of practices to either do them in a more efficient fashion or to save money or those kinds of things space inventory really comes from that discussion that we had early on about at this building, they use their portables this way. And at this building, they use their portables this way. And if you use their portables this way, that's why their capacity looks like it does versus, remember, if, if I'm putting all general ed in my building, my capacity is going to look better than if I'm putting all special ed in my building and putting general ed in the portable. But from a program standpoint, it may be better to put special education in the building because having those kinds of vulnerable populations in a portable may not be the best way to address their needs. So those are kind of that are, are, um, are the main topics to consider within that space inventory. And we want to do it in September because then everybody comes back, their buildings are newly configured, we can kind of get a good sense, and then we can kind of um, go back over the course of the next school year and look at how modifications may or may not have been made within that space um, uh, configuration at each of the buildings, okay? I, basically, this just really gives you a visual uh, understanding of uh, what I just described. But I do want to talk to you about the first three um, arrows there, if you will. Tonight, we're really going to talk about some of the community input data and the grade configuration data. Um, on the 6th, the community builders group will be joining us, and it will be a joint meeting between the board and the community builders to hear from them directly what their recommendations might be in a variety of areas. That could be everything from what types and what kinds of schools we should build and incorporate into the bond to what are the grade configurations that you should be looking at. Um, we understand uh, and we've made it clear to the group that you are the decision arm of this facility master plan but I know you're looking forward to hearing directly from them what their recommendations might be as it relates not only to the bond, but to the master plan as well. And I thought the best way to accomplish that would be to get us all in the same room. Um, as you are aware, that group has done a tremendous job in a very short period uh, to identify some really important strategies that they'll bring forward on the 6th. So, I just want to point that out to you. Then the 27th and, and of uh, June, we'll get together again in a format similar to this and kind of really make sure what we're recommending has um, the support of the board. And if you have any final questions or need any information from my team or community builders, Randy, Michelle, um, regarding or prior to, excuse me, the July 25th board meeting where uh, we hope to have the language and resolution for you. Also at the 6th will be um, Trevor Carlson from, from Piper Jaffray will be there. Uh, Jim McNeil, your bond council will be there. Kim, Howard, Randy. Uh, we'll have the full gamut of folks to answer any questions that you might have. That's going to be a real critical meeting. Okay? Any questions on that part of the update or the schedule? All right. Let's talk about community engagement. And uh, just I know each of you may or may not have had the opportunity to attend one. 
Um, but this was our community engagement process, or this is, excuse me, our community engagement process. And again, um, for everybody's context, we, we came in last September and we took the time to sit down with um, you folks, with Michelle, with the executive cabinet, uh, Randy's team, a number of uh, principals and school folks, teachers, uh, to understand what issues and concerns might exist here as it related to this facility master plan. In addition to that, um, last week I interviewed my 46th community uh, member uh, out there just bringing people in from the port, boys and girls clubs, um, you know, Terra Vida, just, I don't think we've missed an organization and I say that and then uh, there's more to even do. We talked today about uh, talking to more people uh, from Fiesta Foods and, and the business community and uh, homeowners and real estate. So I don't think we can, we can ever end, stop talking. Uh, it's a continual process, but it's been very, very enlightening. And I think they've had um, good response and, and appreciate the fact that we've invited them in to have those conversations. Last week, obviously, uh, the green dots down here in the bottom right corner, um, dealing with community input and the online survey. I just want a big heads up and applause to Joel and his team for getting the survey online, working with our staff. Um, it was, it's just incredible how um, smoothly this has gone. Uh, and I say that in earnest uh, in some of the districts that I've worked in, it hasn't been this smooth. And so hats off to your staff and the team here for helping support us in those areas. Once we have this all together, we will do a second round of walkthroughs with students and staff, staff including you folks, and uh, to really validate that we um, included in this process their thoughts, or if not, why not, and, and, and kind of close the loop on this community engagement process. So tonight we're gonna to share uh, this community input data with you. Tomorrow night we'll share it with the community board, uh, community builders group, excuse me. The online survey uh, went on last Friday, the 19th. It will go through the 31st. We'll have that data for you uh, at the meeting on the 6th. So what you're seeing tonight, the packet that I've given you is from the PAC meeting, uh, Ochoa, Stevens, and McLaughlin. And we will then incorporate the survey data for the meeting on the 6th. We have hard copy surveys at every school. Uh, they can be printed out in both English and Spanish. Any of those that are remaining, we will hand code those in. Let's get to a big issue tonight, um, grade configuration. I wanna start uh, by directing your attention to this document. Um, and this is a grade configuration research PowerPoint that MGT put together for your consumption. Um, I think it's important that you understand as much as possible about grade configuration and the impacts that grade configuration have at a district level. And I'm going to allow you to take this information and digest it. Call me if you have any questions. Um, but I, I would like to give you some of the highlights of this information. You know, in education, we do a lot of research. Um, and the unfortunate thing is that research is not always definitive. It doesn't always say, here's what you should do. And so is the case with grade configuration. There are some important things, though. Transitions, meaning those movements from building to building minimizing those has significant impact. So when we start in the 1940s and 50s and we look at what grade configuration was at that time in our country, it was K-8, 9-12. In the 60s, we changed in early 70s to a K-6, 7-9, kind of a junior high, 10-12 model late 70s, early 80s, we migrated to what is primarily uh, and majority-wise the current model of K5, 6, 8, 9, 12. This research talks a lot about the differences academically and emotionally and psychologically of children in those different grade configurations. But it, again, doesn't point to one and say that's not good or that's better. 
What we know is that this grade configuration research does say academically there are some chal challenges based on particular grade, le grade configurations. I will give you an example. I was speaking to one of my colleagues, uh, Spokane School District, well, which has a 7-8 configuration much like you do, is now reverting back to a 6-8 because their sixth grade group, after about three months in the sixth grade, they were ready to do geometry, but at the elementary level, our teachers are typically generalist. They're not specific. We don't have math specific teachers at the elementary level, and so they were missing that opportunity because our math, science, more specialized instruction is delivered at that middle school um, level. So that's just one example of academically how there's an impact based on grade configuration. I don't mean to single out that 7-8 is worse than 6-8 or anything like that. I'm just sharing with you that that is in another district that's doing 7-8. That's another issue that's come to their attention. Now, I know, Michelle, when, as we were preparing, maybe you could speak to a couple of the other things that you're noticing based on the configuration that we have currently. Sure. So as we've worked on implementation of the Agile Mind curriculum materials, one of the things that we've identified is the need for students who are taking advantage of algebra and geometry at the middle school level to really access a, a year and a half of mathematics in sixth grade so that they're fully prepared to take on the rigors of those courses. Um, so we're in a process of realigning the academic um, standards and expectations in grade six. And there's complexity in um, kind of bridging between the elementary system and the, and the middle school system and doing that. Um, I think another piece when we think and talk about that, um, our outrageous outcome of all ninth graders passing algebra by the end of ninth grade, I believe we can influence that by allowing um, the students who are ready to do that in seventh and eighth grade. Um, you know, when you house the students sixth, seventh, and eighth under a one system, it just, um, it impacts that, the ability to do that work more seamlessly. It's easier when the sixth, seventh, and eighth grade is under one system. And so for program alignment, it, it, the sixth, seventh, eighth grade configuration does make some sense. Um, so that's one program implementation piece that we've been navigating um, as we've looked at the Agile Minds in correlation with um, our outreach outcome of all of our students meeting standard or passing algebra by the end of ninth grade. Thank you. Um, so what, the other piece of this then, so the, the research doesn't point to a specific one. So what we're trying to focus on and really uh, narrow down on are the academic impacts and the fiscal impacts, okay? So I'm going to kind of walk you through some of the fiscal impacts of the current grade configuration in terms of capacity. So if we look at the uh, columns on the, the left, this is elementary school, the 7782 represents your total elementary school capacity. So currently at the K-6 in 2017, you have 10,087 students. So we're about 2,305 students over capacity. If we were to do nothing in 2026, based on the enrollment projections that we've completed, you'll be 3,974 students over capacity, which is approximately 165 classrooms, okay? If you were to have the same amount of students, or excuse me, the same amount of capacity today, and you were in a K-5 arrangement, you would have a 920 seat overage, and in 2026, 2,302 seats over. Okay, so the elementary level capacity is signific significantly impacted by the K-6 configuration. It also financially, if you think about building approximately seven schools in a 20-year period versus, or a 10-year period versus six schools, financially there is a signific significant impact. So I want to make sure we're all on the same page here. So what I'm, I'm saying is that at K-6, by 2026 with 3,974 kids, 700 kids in elementary school, we've, almost, we've got to build six of them versus 
at 2026 in a K-5 configuration, we'd only have to build three of them, okay? Does that make sense to everyone? Follow my logic here? Now, the benefit of K-6 obviously comes up in the next line at the middle school level. Right now, we have 20 seats extra at the middle school by having seven, eight in that range, given that we have 2,652 seats available. By 2026, in our current configuration, we'll be 459 over, okay? So our capacity at middle school will be um, adequate for the next 10 years. If we were to move to a 6-8 configuration, we'd be about 1,364 short today and a projected 2,130 short, or we'd need roughly an additional middle school, okay? One middle school. So, I'm sorry, I cannot stand still and do this, okay? I apologize. And uh, so if you need to, I'll speak loud so you can hear me, all right? This would, this would mean, oh, there you go, great, thank you, all right. So if we think about that in terms of fiscal impact, in terms of potentially what we might consider in a bond, all of that sort of thing, six and three. Six new middle schools and three current uh, middle schools would probably take care of this model. Six, six new elementary schools. Six new elementary schools, okay? Now, I'm gonna share with you that in the community input sessions, the big issues, and I, I don't think I'm gonna surprise anybody here, um, overcrowding, program equity, those kinds of things. So program equity, let's zoom in on that how much more challenging it might be to do program equity over a larger number of elementary schools. We currently have 15. This would take us to 21 elementary schools. So lots more elementary, less middle, okay? Not to say that we don't need a middle, another middle school, but it is about a half full at this point if we were to build another one. Over here, we can build three elementaries and an additional middle school. Because remember, on our, if you look on your capacity handout there, the uh, stoplight configuration there, you'll notice that middle schools have some capacity in them right now. So we would do some attendance boundary adjustment with this and incorporate a new middle school, and we would balance this uh, enrollment pretty substantially. This combination eliminates 50% of the portables in the building, or in the district, excuse me. This combination eliminates about 26% of the portables in the district. All right. One, one more. Um, based on our community builders group uh, input, we also wanted to look at 7-9 versus 7-8. Again, if you'll look at the very top line on the two columns on the left, 2305 and 3974 did not change. Those are the same grade configurations, K-6, K-6. The ones on the next line over, 2305 and 3974 did change because that was a K-5, right? Let me just help you out here. See those in that 920-2302? They don't change here because it's 2305. We're, we're staying K-6, okay? Now you look at the middle school configuration of 7-8. We still have 20 extra seats and 459. But in the K-6 model, going to 7-9 model, because we're taking the ninth grade out of our high schools, now putting it in our middle schools, we increase the overage at the middle school level. Okay, so we're, we're now, we have capacity issues clear through K through eight. All right, back here, we have a capacity issue at K six, but we're okay at seven, eight, or we're okay at K five and seven, six, eight, we need to do something in both those areas. But in this area where we go K six, seven through nine, 
we're impacting K through nine, we're overcrowded everywhere. And from a fiscal standpoint, this would be the most expensive model because we'd have to build elementaries and multiple middle schools, okay? Now, I, in all transparency here, it does wonderful things at the high school for us, right? We're overcrowded at the high school, no doubt. But we uh, essentially, by going K679, make 1012 a very comfortable and uh, less crowded environment. But the other 10 grades, K through 9, become very crowded, okay? It's, I just want you to make sure you understand this difference, okay? That if we look at staying where we are, K6, 7, 8, there are some academic impacts to, um, that we're gonna have to address through program, uh, through additional support, um, whatever the case may be. Michelle and her team could speak to that better than I can. From a financial standpoint, from a financial standpoint, seven, K6, 7, 8 is a very expensive model very expensive being that I've got to build six elementary schools, okay, to the tune of 25 to 30 million dollars a piece, 180 million dollars, okay. Seven nine gives us some option, but really creates crowding K through nine and alleviates only the overcrowding at the high school. I'm not asking you to make a decision tonight. I'm just trying to perform, uh, provide you with information in this data that I've given you tonight, you'll, you have capacity numbers um, for both K-5 and K-6, so you can look at by building by building that comparison. If you stay the same, if we change to K-5, uh, K-6, 8, what does that do? We're going to need to ha uh, answer that question on June 6th, when we get back together with the Community Builders Group. They've been doing some significant work in this area. We will finish that work up tomorrow night. Um, it is my intent to have a, a recommendation for you on the 6th from that group about what grade configuration um, you might want to adopt going forward. I do want to calm uh, those that might be watching or those that might watch this video later. This is a long-term transition, long-term meaning over the next five years. This is not a light switch activity. We're not going to K-6 in September of 2017, right? Uh, so everybody just kind of <laughs> pumped the brakes on that one. Um, but it is, if there was a change to be made, um, there are some real, um, we've talked about strategies about how that migration would go about. Uh, one of the mantra that we've adopted is uh, renovate and then migrate. It's always nice to send students to a new building. Uh, so we would want to look at our um, potential bond um, resolution in terms of what we're going to build as to how that would impact those grade configuration um, alignments that we're going to move forward and make decisions on over the course of the next month. Questions about that data? Nothing? Okay. As, as you know, I'm available anytime if you guys, I've given you, I'm giving you a lot of data tonight because on the 6th, I want us all to be up to speed on this because we're going to have some deep discussion about it. And, and so hopefully you'll have some time between now and June 6th, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, to, to review this and look at it and um, really get a strong sense of, of what it means, both from a research standpoint but also from a program and uh, fiscal standpoint. I would, I would guess that uh, one of the things coming out of tomorrow night um, that Michelle and Glinda and Eric, uh, at my request, will help me put together is uh, those a more detailed programmatic impact to kids academically, uh, K-6 versus K-5, that kind of a thing, so that you also understand where that might be um, You've heard me say this if, if you attended one of the things. One of the great, great things about the Pasco School District that is often overlooked is if you go back 10 years and look at the achievement data, and you look at the achievement data now, 
uh, you've made about a 20, 30 point gain in some areas. The last thing that I would want to have happen is for this master plan to somehow uh, slow that momentum down. And, and so this grade configuration issue, uh, given some of the things that may come out of our meeting tomorrow night and we talk about on the 6th, it's going to be really important to address. Can, can you send us uh, some of the background information, or at least me, um, on the calcs for how you determine how many portables will be reduced in the two options and then how many new elementary and middle schools we need for the two yeah. options? L let me... Um, this is this is the one I'm most familiar with. Could I borrow that microphone again, Ray? Right Thank you. Um, so if if we were to assume that we were to put two elementary schools in play and two middle schools in play at sometime in the future over the course of the next ten years, we would have an additional fourteen hundred seats based on the two elementaries being 700 each, which would put us over by about 1,000, okay? So across all of the elementary schools, we would only need to house about um, 300 students in portables, okay? Currently, we're housing 2,305 students in portables. So that's where a big piece of that goes. But also, places like McLaughlin that have 30 portables, if we were to add, in this grade configuration, um, a, you know, do something with Stevens and add a middle school possibly, we would take out that chunk. So with two elementaries and two middle schools, we would reduce this significantly where this would be zero and this Zero meaning all portables at the middle schools would be gone. Have, have you accounted for that quite a few of those portables at the middle school may already be able to be gone if we look at those numbers right there that show that our middle school capacity today is um, 26, what is it, 2632, and we have 2652. Theoretically, we could have no middle schools today. Or no, sorry, no portables today at the middle school level. Yeah. Well, that that's kind of like I don't know how to say it. We have some fat there that we're saying if we pass this bond, we're going to eliminate these extra portables. Well, even if we didn't pass the bond, if we wanted to take portables out, we could. And I think that's the real impetus of the space inventory study, okay. is to find out how much of this really is needed at the elementary and middle school level. How many of those portables could we reduce? Um, to your point, uh, in the current situation, right? If any, a, a lot, we don't know. But it, it's challenging this time of year to do that because there's so much going on in buildings that I think if we let things settle down a little bit right after the start of the school year, we'll get a good sense of just how many of those you need. But it's a great point. It's a great I'm point. just trying to determine in my head how much weight I give to the statement whatever the final calculation is that we come up with for this quick decision, that option A removes 50% of the portables and option B removes 75 or whatever the numbers come out to be, how much weight am I going to give that in my head when it sounds like there may be additional studies that need to be done to really compare the two options for portables? Yeah, I, I, I would agree. I, I guess my... Um, my, my sense would be, though, that um, some of this overage is going to be moved to this, right? Because you're you're only you're only 2305 over now at elementary. If you're 3974 over in 10 years, um, are you going to take some of those portables too? If you, if you don't build it. I don't know. We'd have to uh, change. I mean, in the past, we've said that middle school portables are different in our district than yep, elementary yep. school, and we can't reuse them. I, we could change that. Yeah. How we have well, bathrooms and stuff, we've well, said. We are. Yeah. We're moving yeah. middle school portables to elementary, so we right. can change that practice. Yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So what in, in the one, um, when you're looking at the, uh, the middle school as going back to the sixth through ninth, how large of a middle school are, are 
was the capacity of the middle school. So building a new middle school, what was the capacity that, that you were looking at? Right, right. Let me go back to that slide. So here, if we have 4782 in 2026, uh, we would want to have roughly, you know, four L, uh, middle schools at about 1,200. It's, you know, if we built a, a new one, we remodeled Stevens and new in lieu of uh, uh, in that area, we'd want to do four of those uh, new middle school, a uh, remodel of Stevens, and two new elementary schools in that model would be. How, how would we get 1,200 in Stevens, Ochoa? You're saying 1,200 at Stevens, Ochoa, Mac, and a new middle school. Yeah. And right now we have um, some people who don't like a school being that big, middle schools being that big. I'm just curious if the, right, the, 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 the community the, builders have weighed in on that yet. Well, I think where we are, um, and uh, there's a few here, if they want to jump in, feel free. Um, I think I, early on in the process, I brought you the, the research, or at least um, articulated the research around elementaries, ideally five to 700, middle schools nine to 1100, and high schools 15 to 1800. Uh, that's ideal. Right? I'm not sure the Pasco School District can afford ideal, okay? So um, does that mean that along with a, um, an upgrade of Stevens and a new middle school that we don't have to put an addition on at other middle schools? It, it certainly doesn't mean that. It doesn't. Currently at, at, at your middle schools, um, we have um, capacity of, of just under 1,000 with the exception of Stevens. So, if we had two at 1,000 and a new one at 1,200 and um, a renovated at 20, we'd be at about 44, 4782 is the 10 year thing. So, we, you know, I, I, again, I, what I, I don't want to convey to anybody is that, that we have a plan already. We don't. I'm trying to develop scenarios so that everybody can kind of get a context of what grade level or grade configuration impact does. And that school size may have to fluctuate some to more a larger capacity in your school district because of um, this next slide. Sorry, can I say, can I you make sure one more thing on going back a couple? The slide you're just on, just to make sure I understand. Uh, one more right there. The second column from the right is showing this. Sorry, is that it? Um, go back one more. The second column from the right on the bottom shows us that if we built an, an additional middle school so that we have four of them and went to the 6-8 configuration, on day one we're going to be averaging 1,000 students or better or more at each of the four middle schools correct. in that configuration. That's okay. correct. All right. That's correct. Thank you. I have a couple comments on this one too, Mr. Clark. This is a good one to stay on. So a um, couple thoughts come to mind as we kind of reevaluate the last year and our discussions, community input as we plan for previous bonds and uh, some things I think that we shied away from addressing that I think we have to address and it looks like we're going to. So one is the great configuration. I think we kind of came up with bond proposals and we kind of shied away from that topic, just kind of hoping we would approach it in the future and that can't happen we have to because that is an integral part of what our facility planning is so we can't not make some decisions around that and if we decide something and in three or four years they want to change it i won't be offended or feel like they're not honoring my decision or what we decide as a board because i know that's something that was expressed in the past like we have to honor their work or whatever but we, we need to decide some of those things and move forward it can change, but but that has to be part of, of the discussion and decision making as we decide on, on facilities. Another one that we kind of shied away from, reassessing boundaries. Uh, yep. That came up in, in the community builders or the community input session that I was at. We, we, we really have to reassess that. Appropriate utilization of space. So the middle school, for example, in your capacity numbers, Ochoa is at 78% capacity and yet they have 10 portables. Correct. So that is very 
pretty nearly impossible to explain to someone that's analyzing space and facility needs and we're saying that we need this but yet and they're not full but they've got 10 portables so that's a question that people have and an appropriate question and lastly what numbers don't capture is the experience of our students at the schools and so when we look at these numbers and we may say for example in your uh, 7 8 in 2026, 459 over capacity. So we look, oh, that doesn't sound too bad. But, but in reality, the middle schools struggle to handle overcrowding as much as the elementary schools. We've been told that over and over again by people uh, that have children at elementary school and middle school and teachers. And one of the primary reasons is the elementary students are with the same teacher all day. So they are able to handle a more crowded school Whereas in the middle school, it starts to affect the experiences of everyone, participation in activities, sports, clubs, crowding at lunchtime, before school, after school. And so uh, 459 may not seem like a lot, but when you only have three schools that you're dividing that to as opposed to 15, it becomes a big deal. And so those are the types of things that I think we have to address as we finalize some of these decisions in the next uh, month or two. Uh, because all the numbers we look at don't capture what's actually happening with our students at those schools. Yeah, I, you bring up some excellent points. Um, you know, it, why do we have 10 portables at a middle school that is not at full capacity? Um, there could be a myriad of reasons for that, um, but it has to be examined. We have to look at it, and I think that's, again, that space inventory study will help us with that. I think you're spot on with your analysis of kids at middle school we know are being ec uh, impacted significantly at extracurricular level uh, we know uh, I, I don't know if I got this exactly right but there are large numbers of kids trying out for band and track and 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 to think that we're coaching you know that many kids with the limited number of coaching staff or music instructors that we have in a in a substantial way is is challenging and so um, the schools need to be smaller and and there's this delta that's coming that we're discussing both at the community builder level and at, at the cabinet level where is where where are we and what can we financially afford in relationship to grade configuration um, you brought up a number of programmatic issues and extracurricular activities uh, the staff did as well as we were preparing for this, um, and, and we certainly want to take those all into account. But the other issue is this, right? The other issue is we've got about $144 million to work with. Um, and just to step you through this, I know some of you have seen it, but you've got about $5.6 billion in assessed value. 5% uh, of that, the maximum allowable debt capacity in the state of Washington is 280 million. Currently with m and bond, copier leases, all, all of that sort of debt, you have about 136 million and you've got about 144 million remaining. So when we put this bond package together for potentially November, um, that's the number we're going to have to work within and, and that helps us understand how much we can move the needle when we look at grade configurations. If we, if we think we have to build six new elementary schools in the next 10 years to address growth and capacity, that number may not get us there. Um, so we have to be fiscally responsible in our approach to this. We can't go out and ask for the world knowing that uh, we don't have those resources available. So let's talk about that kind of need. So you've heard me before say if we bring all the buildings that scored less than 90 back to 90, that's $120 million in deferred maintenance. Now, there's some that may or may not need all of that, and we may not need to spend all of that money, but that's what's been identified. If you look at in the next 20 years, uh, you're going to need a new high school. You're going to need two new middle schools. You're going to need a minimum of three new elementary schools at current market value. That's not with escalation and inflation and all those things. It's approximately $235 million. 
And if we look at then some schools that have good sites, meaning they're large enough to add additions and, and renovations to, we could reach another $100 million. So we've got $455 million in need, and we've got $144 million to work with. And that's why it's so important that we address this grade configuration and capacity and uh, attendance boundary and portable usage and all of these things going forward so that we make the best use of those dollars and create the greatest positive impact on students. All right. I, I've got a lot of supporting data that you've seen. If we need to bring it up, I'm more than happy to. But I just, I, I want to take, we've got about 10 or so minutes left here in the session. And I just want to get your thoughts or any other questions that you might have. Um, I'll be making a condensed uh, presentation of this in the board meeting this evening. But are there other questions that you may have or that I could answer or concerns going forward? Okay. I have a question. On the um, community input sessions, we have three handouts here with the uh, results from each of the three. Is this going to be compiled in additionally and uh, right. analyzed by us, or are we on our own to analyze it? And no, no. Uh, okay. We will be coming forward next week and emailing to you uh, the documentation once the website closes and we have all of that information. But I just wanted to give you some initial stuff tonight. Okay. But yeah, what I en <coughs> envision will come out um, is a comparative uh, across <clears throat> every question set. You'll see Pack, Ochoa, Stevens, McLaughlin total, so that you can look at the percentages that there were in differences. We'll also disaggregate that by our demographic question, parent, employee, and uh, resident but no student, so that we can look at, okay, how did parents answer versus resident with no student? How did employees answer versus parents, those kinds of uh, disaggregation. So it's just waiting for this web survey to, to get done and then we'll do it. Um, so duplicating the effort was a little bit more than we wanted to spend it this time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have one more question too. If you can go back to the financial, I know we kind of skipped through a sweet hour there, right there's perfect. I'm going to throw this out there, and, and you and I talked about this. I asked you about it, but I know it's not a standard. It's outside the box, and it's, you know, you talk, we talk about high school. Well, that's going to be 80, middle school 40, elementary 20, 25. I'm going to throw this out there just so it can simmer for a while. One way that we can address this uh, in a way would be to uh, include in our facilities planning a uh, homeschool like a home link project which would be about five million and would could relieve some of the stress from a lot of elementary schools that's more geared towards elementary school so we could build something like that or include that in our facilities planning and, and provide a service that's not currently being provided in Pasco and relieve some of the crowding for a much more affordable chunk of that as opposed to 25 million for a new elementary school. Is that assuming that some of the people who are in elementary school now will opt for homeschooling? Is right, that your yeah, so that like at whatever Franklin, there's 800 kids, or Livingston, there's eight or 900 kids, that maybe 50 or 100 of those would come, 50 from Franklin, something like that, yeah. The other thing, just throwing it out there, let it simmer. A lot of people we heard over the last year were, we had this discussion about Chiawana adding on to the building permanently, and a lot of people felt that, well, that then we're gonna make that school forever huge. But waiting 10 years to address the high schools isn't very palatable either, and clearly 80 million for high school is not, can't be a priority uh, in this model when we look at the, where the needs are. So, I visited Delta last week, our waiting list for Delta is huge, and it's going to get bigger every year. I think they affect, uh, accepted roughly 50 students from Pasco because it's a, all three cities, and we had 60 students on a waiting list. So we could include in our facilities planning uh, in an upcoming potential bond proposal a second Delta for just Pasco students. I'm confident it would fill up immediately the first year. Uh, it was 
we could build that for roughly 15 million uh, and address the high school issue, not have to wait 10 years uh, to address high school, and that also could relieve some of the crowding at our two comprehensive high schools uh, for a much smaller chunk, and so that we're trying to uh, address more of these issues in our planning than just saying we're gonna have to wait 10 years to address high school. So I just wanna throw that out there. If you have a chance to put add some numbers by one of the next meetings, that'd be great, but I, those are the numbers I roughly found for those two additional options. There's probably others that we need to talk about as well. Um, I'm, I'm especially intrigued uh, by the innovative high school model, is what it's commonly called. Um, we see this uh, occurring around the country um, where we're taking that kind of Delta-esque model, putting six to 800 students in a smaller kind of high school environment that uh, really does, um, depending on those students' needs, change some of that academic performance in that key area. I think home-based programs, um, running start programs, all of those things need to be examined in terms of how they impact capacity and um, obviously this need that we have. So um, I, I do appreciate that you are openness to that discussion because when we come on the 6th, I, I don't want it to be perceived that we already have a solution because we do not. We really are coming. I think the, um, if you've known some of the people on the community builders group, there are some strong personalities in that group and, and I appreciated working with every one of them. Um, to that end, I think they have some opinions just like we all have some opinions about what should be done. And the, the really uh, exciting thing about the next step in this process is by getting all those people together in a room, we're going to come up with the best solution for PASCO. And that's what I'm excited about. So, so go, I just go ahead. I don't know if you, you'd ask if we have any questions on previously. So. I, uh, <clears throat> this grade configuration thing is, is uh, in my opinion, is going to be a huge, um, I'm not sure what the right word is. Anyway, it, that, that is a big deal. I mean, I, I don't know if we went into this um, carefully thinking about it when we decided to move sixth grade down. That was a decision that was driven by, by our space needs. Um, I don't think it's wise to be flipping back and forth every three or four years because of whatever reason. I think whatever we do, we've got to, we've got to make the decision. I mean, I can appreciate that, that I'm not going to be offended if five years from now they decide to change it, but, but uh, this is something that I think we've got to give some real long and hard thought to and make sure that we do the right thing for long term, not, not just uh, the flavor of the day. That, that concerns me when it comes to this grade configuration because we could be flipping back and forth for a long time just trying to find a place to put sixth grade and that's not helpful either. I know there's, uh, th that was one of the reasons I didn't want to get into looking at moving sixth grade back into the middle school. We just moved them down to the elementary school and, and let's give it time to work or not work and, and if we're going to make the change, we'll make it based on some um, real reason. So I would just, I'm curious to know how that comes out, but uh, if there's anything that, that I think the community builders need to come together on, it is that. It's, uh, I think from a program, there's lots of advantages to having sixth grade in the element, or in the middle school. We've heard that from teachers and counselors who have come and spoken to us. Parents, very few parents are saying, wow, we wish our sixth graders were back in the middle school. In fact, most of them are saying, I'm glad they're in the, in the, in the elementary school. So this will be an interesting discussion. I'm not sure it's one we're going to solve in two months to be able to make a decision. Um, but certainly long term, I think that's something that would be critical that we identify which direction we're going to take. And then we need to put a stake in the ground and say, this is a decision we made. And and uh, this is why, and I think we need to stick with it. So, thank you. I agree with you. I, I think it is probably the most critical decision we have in front of us at this time. Um, I, I, I do hear a number of parents say, I like to have my student in the sixth grade, uh, particularly sixth grade parents. I like to have my kid in the elementary school. 
I, I will tell you that I hear a lot of kindergarten and first grade parents say, I wish you'd get those sixth graders out of my elementary school because they're picking on my kindergarten and first grader, which I firmly respond to. But if we move the sixth graders, you know, the fifth graders will just fill that void and pick on them anyway. So, uh, you know, you're, but you're right. It, it, it's, it's really identifying. And I think what we did do, and you can look at the data in the, in the community input sessions, grade configuration was not as hot a topic as I thought it was going to be. I didn't hear people in the small group saying, do not touch them. Don't do that. Um, it was more around overcrowding, boundary adjustments, program equity. I've got some things I'm going to show you in the board meeting, the top, what we liked and what we didn't like. Uh, but I, I think you're, you're absolutely right, Steve. I think that the, the issue here is whatever we do, we're building a 10-year master plan around we should at least commit to that length of period to stay at fastness or staying uh, the course on that particular configuration. So um, with respect to, to Dr. Richards, who is accurate, if we're all not here in five years, it's pretty tough for us to control what goes on in five years. But to the point that we're, we're building a plan for 10 years, our plan, one of the assumptions will be the grade configuration stays the same, whatever that is. Okay? All right. Other questions? Sherry, anything from you tonight? Okay. I have a question. I don't know if it's uh, something for you to look into, Mr. Clark or, or Mr. Nunnemaker, the district, but um, I'm curious with the, I, I think I've mentioned it to both of you before, with the impact fees that we're getting and with the board not spending those impact fees on portables at this time, um, I can't remember if we get a million dollars a year or what it is. I'd like to know what kind of debt we could secure. I know it's non-voted debt, but could we secure enough debt with those impact fees that we're bringing in each year, especially with the increased construction that's going on now, to build an elementary school, um, to build what? It takes some more research, and I don't know if it's part of our decision. I don't think it's part of our decision on what we do at the bond, but um, part of facilities planning, I'd like to know the answer to that one. Do you remember, President Lerman, that just recently Mr. Roberts had uh, shared that I think we this year we've received 1.3 million, I believe I read, which has already had surpassed significantly what we thought we would get. And I agree with that type of a mindset that we should, should pool that money and actually build a school, which we can do with impact fees. I just want to share, I, I do agree with Mr. Christensen. I think if the community builders can, and that's going to be, it's kind of the elephant in the room, the lightning rod, whatever you want to call this, but that we need to address that. And so I'd, I'd appreciate to hear their input on that, um, especially with concerns in the past about task forces, and this was kind of a new model. And so I think this is an opportunity to kind of see, let them uh, present some opinions about that and, and, and kind of see what they have to say, because that, that really is fundamental to what we would choose to put into a bond. I mean, if, if we're going to, one or the other. Do we add another middle school? Do we put sixth grade back? Do we keep it? But that is an integral decision in what we decide building-wise to put on a, a potential bond. It's in that um, they will come with opinions. I'm pretty <laughs> confident of that. that. That's the one thing I'm confident about tonight. So if there's nothing... That, yeah, well, I, that's my job, right? Tomorrow is to kind of help get them to uh, minimal or a single opinion. Um, thank you for your time. I hope this was uh, helpful to, to give you the update. I think this process and certainly coming out of the community engagement meetings last week, um, I felt there was just a real uh, excitement around this effort throughout the district. Uh, people are very appreciative of the uh, opportunity to take part in this kind of a thing. Um, and I think over the next few months, we will coalesce into a great vision for Pasco schools. So appreciate your time this evening. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Thank you for your work and your team's work on, on this endeavor with us. And we also thank all the uh, community members who have taken part in the community, community builders group and also in last week's uh, meetings. Um, please join us at 630 for a regularly scheduled board meeting.